We believe in the power of the law to advance democracy, equity, and justice. It takes a collective effort to transform lives and protect the well-being of our communities. Let's renew our commitment to our shared ideals. Let's stand at the forefront of the issues of the day. Hello, I'm Mary Smith, president of the American Bar Association with another episode of the ABA Presidential Speaker Series. Under the theme, Lifting Our Voices, Charting the Future, these fireside chats spotlight trailblazers shaping our collective future, inspiring thought, and fostering understanding of pressing global issues. I'm excited to present today's program, which is a panel of AI experts. The panel will be moderated by Lucy Thompson, chair of the ABA's Task Force on Law and Artificial Intelligence. Lucy? Thanks, Mary. You created the ABA Task Force on Law and Artificial Intelligence to look at the significant issues impacting the legal profession and the practice of law. Our guests today are the special advisors to the ABA AI Task Force. They are Daniel Ho, member of the National AI Advisory Committee and professor of law at Stanford Law School and associate director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. Michelle Lee is a former Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. She is the CEO and founder of Obsidian Strategies. Trooper Sanders is also a member of the National AI Advisory Committee. He is CEO of Benefits Data Trust. Miriam Vogel is the chair of the National AI Advisory Committee, and she is president and CEO of Equal AI. Seth Waxman is a former Solicitor General of the United States, and he is currently a partner at Wilmer Hale. With AI capturing the headlines and top of mind, there is much to discuss. We will talk today about how AI may impact lawyers and legal practice, the new White House executive order on AI, some important international developments, and how AI may improve access to justice. So let's get started. We're going to focus now on how AI impacts legal practice. And I want to start with Michelle Lee and ask from your perspective in Silicon Valley, how is AI being integrated into legal practice and how will it be used? Thank you very much, Lucy. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, Even before the launch of ChatGPT less than a year ago, I said that AI is the most transformative technology of our generation. Analogous to the discovery of electricity, and how electricity transformed our society, including virtually every business and how it operates and every aspect of our personal lives. So I believe that AI will do the same, perhaps not immediately, uh, but certainly over a period of time. I was seeing this in my work with companies that were using AI to provide better services to clients and customers, to improve their operational efficiencies and to accelerate innovations. And now with generative AI, even more so. With generative AI, computers are now able to create new content, a historically human task with text, image, and sound. And public chatbots have now democratized AI, putting the power of large language models in the hands of every person. So no longer do you need to have a team of data scientists and access to expansive computing and lots of data in order to take advantage of these powerful AI applications. Virtually every aspect of our society is and will continue to be impacted by AI. In fact, in a study conducted by OpenAI and the University of Pennsylvania, they predict that 80% of the workforce will have more than 10% of their work 
affected by AI. And 19% of the workforce will have at least 50% of their work affected by AI. The most exposed occupations include writers and authors, administrative assistants, accountants and auditors, and as we look at the impact on the legal profession today, some but not all the tasks in the legal profession. Generative AI is particularly good at finding and summarizing large volumes of information, producing natural language responses. So think about what lawyers, particularly young lawyers, spend a lot of their time doing. Researching, reviewing, summarizing large amounts of information, whether cases, contracts, due diligence, discovery documents, regulations, or statutes. So in the Silicon Valley, I'm seeing a plethora of companies focused on applying AI to various legal-related areas, to discovery, automatic review of volumes of documents, and the generation of attorney-client work product privilege information. For the litigators in the audience, you can remember how much time we spent generating those documents as a young associate. On the litigation side, drafting first drafts of complaints and motions to dismiss and other pleadings, um, oftentimes customized to a certain judge based upon their prior rulings, summaries of depositions, even predicting their rulings. In the intellectual property field, automatically generating first drafts of patent applications and conducting prior art searches. And in the area of contracts, drafting first drafts and given key provisions, reviewing and extracting key clauses, and checking for compliance with legal requirements. So these are just a few examples, but there is so much more that is being done, and there's a lot of activity that will have implications on the legal profession and the practice of law. Let's turn to Miriam Vogel. Um, what has your research shown about practice areas that are impacted by AI? Thanks so much, Lucy. And as Michelle points out, there are so many ways that that generative AI can benefit our legal practice. Uh, you know, I think even more importantly than democratize the access to AI, as Michelle touched on, is that it opened everyone's eyes to the possibility. Uh, but I think what's important for us to note is most of the people using AI today, which is most of those who are listening uh, to this session today, are using older forms of AI that have been in the wild for some years. So if you don't think you're using it, how did you navigate to a location this morning what was the feed of your newsreel on, on the um, app where you got your news this morning? Um, you know, most importantly, we need to be thinking about the pivotal ways that you're using it, uh, your HR departments. It's creating tremendous efficiencies. It's creating so much access, but we also need to be thinking about the ways that our clients are using it uh, and how it could create liability for them without their knowing it. Uh, so our work has really been focused on looking at potential risks that clients, that companies, individuals are taking on through their reliance on AI with an implicit bias that AI is neutral and correct because it's computer science without understanding that there is liability, there is discrimination that could be built into the systems. And so when we think about the practice of law and AI, I am so glad we're having this conversation today so that we can touch on some of the ways that every lawyer needs to be making sure that not only their own use, but their client's use to, uh, is, is legitimate, is, is lawful. If you're thinking about contract negotiations, what's a material breach, consumer protection laws, intellectual property, so many of the pieces that we're going to be touching on today are traditional laws on the books already in use for many, many years that are implicated by the AI use that you and your client is are undertaking today? Well, these are very important questions that we'll um, continue to focus on. One question on every lawyer's mind is, will AI replace lawyers? And we have some questions from the audience. The first question is from Steve Wu who was a longtime ABA leader and a member of the Silicon Valley Law Group. He is a past chair of the ABA Science and Technology Law Section and chair of the ABA AI and Robotics National Institute, now in its fifth year. We just finished the American Bar Association Artificial Intelligence and Robotics National Institute, 
And after the end of that institute, what I think the attendees really wanted to know is in this era of sweeping technological change that's happening so fast with artificial intelligence, what do lawyers and law firms, both outside counsel and in-house lawyers, what, what do these lawyers and law firms need to do to prepare themselves to provide comprehensive legal services to AI vendors and customers? Well, I think one of the important things for the customers of AI, um, you know, be it a, a for-profit or non-profit, particularly those who are exposed um, in different matters of public interest, um, or in rights affecting areas, um, such as access to, to government programs or, or other things, um, is really considering the, the current rules on the books about um, access and discrimination and other types of things, and then really understanding what are the implications that can either sharpen um, the, the, the risk um, or blunt it that, that AI presents. I also believe that for customers of AI, they are not only trying to figure out what is legal or not, but particularly since there, you know, there are still a number of laws and regulations that need to be developed, um, how these are affecting their operations, what are the implications? And so, you know, in many cases, um, as you know, um, lawyers earn a good living, not just dealing with narrowly defined legal questions, but being broader consigliaries to their clients and really helping them just think through and understand um, particular issues. And so I think it's this broader conversation and counsel that is also going to be needed um, outside of and beyond kind of narrow legal questions. Related to that question is another one from Spencer Rubin, who is a member of the Brian Cave Law Firm in Colorado and co-chair of the newly created AI initiative for the ABA Young Lawyers Division. What AI skills and programs should young lawyers train on to be more competitive in the job market as well as effective counselors for their clients in the future? The rise of generative AI is one of the most important things for uh, lawyers to get a handle on. And so that includes understanding things like how do you do forms of what, are, what folks call prompt engineering to actually try to extract answers that are useful for the task that you're engaged in? One of the things that a number of law professors have started to do is to actually have chat GPT generated exam uh, answers that then students have to correct, which really teaches folks what are some of the ways in which generative AI answers can actually be quite brittle and uh, wrong. And ultimately, the key to all of this is really for us to identify the areas where the rapid rise of generative AI will complement and not substitute human judgment and to understand what are the parts of the legal practice that are simply not feasible, that are the most complementary uh, to uh, forms of generative AI. Right now, uh, some of those areas are really about human judgment and legal reasoning. Uh, SCOTUS blog had a, a, a very nice, simple example where they asked 50 questions about the Supreme Court. Uh, I think uh, ChatGPT got 21 of those uh, factually right, 26 confidently wrong. Uh, so there's a lot that we have to keep in mind uh, when we rely uh, on answers by these kinds of systems. It seems to me that, you know, the adoption, the widespread adoption of AI tools is going to require, and I'm, I'm focused not just on, I know Spencer's question was about young lawyers and law students, but I think it equally applies to middle-aged lawyers or aged lawyers like me, perhaps even more so. It's going to require training. I think it should start at law schools on how to properly construct, construct prompts or queries and how to evaluate any results. And I think Training is also going to be required on compliance with confidentiality concerns um, and considerations involving bias, uh, about which I know we're going to talk later on and I'll have some other thoughts about. I, I think there is a need for practical in-service classes or law school classes for lawyers that are centered around you know, technological and big data literacy, as well as the ability to actually practice using AI tools in a guided setting. 
a lot easier in law schools, particularly law schools that are affiliated with a university that has an electrical engineering program. Um, and the last thing I think going to like whose jobs are gonna be eliminated and whose will be enhanced. I think particularly for law students and young lawyers, we need really realistic assessments of where there are gonna be more opportunities for attorneys in the future and which practices, and Michelle hit on some of them, might see less of a legal need. So Seth, you've suggested some important areas for the ABA and state and local bars to work on. So Michelle Lee, you mentioned uh, the power of chat GPT and generative AI and the new functionalities that apply. What are the IP implications for this new generative AI and large language models? When ChatGPT first launched, I thought this was amazing, incredibly powerful. But then, of course, as the former head of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and advisor to the president on intellectual property issues, I thought, ooh, what about the intellectual property issues? And there are so many introduced by generative AI. Um, not surprisingly, um, the uh, developers of these large language models essentially crawled the entirety of the internet for content to train their models, petabytes worth of data. And the question is, of course, what if any intellectual property rights or licenses did they obtain in order to train the models that are producing the solutions that we are all amazed by? So we quickly saw uh, a bunch of lawsuits brought by IP owners, including Getty Images for, of course, IP infringement. Now, that's just the issue of what rights did the creators of these large language models have in developing the models? Another unanswered question is who owns the resulting intellectual property rights? If, for example, I create an image using DALI, do I as the person who entered the prompt that triggered the response own the resulting intellectual property rights? And what about um, the company that created, trained, maintains and owns the AI system? Do they have any rights? Now, perhaps that's contractually uh, granted to the user of the system, but then what about the information that was used to train the AI system? What underlying rights might those individuals have? So, and of course, the last question, which is with the resulting work product, is it even eligible for protection? How much and to what degree? And what I will say is that the Copyright Office has said that it will not register works produced by a machine um, and only register works produced by a human. And similarly, on the patent side of things, if you're using one of these large language models and you invent something, what, if any, rights do you have to that? And the patent office uh, affirmed by a ruling from the federal circuit said that an inventor for patent purposes must be an individual i.e. a natural person. So all the laws and regulations and policies um, will be re-examined. The patent office and copyright offices are uh, seeking input from the public on these issues. And an important role for the ABA and members of the bar is to really think about what are the laws, regulations, and policies we need to continue to incentivize the creativity and the innovation we all desire. Otherwise, if we don't, what will end up happening is we end up using that same body of content and we don't get new innovations and new expressions and creative works. So there are serious implications on the intellectual property front. Well, we look forward to working with you, Michelle, and the other special advisors on these very important issues. So we're now going to turn to uh, two very important developments from the White House and the Office of Management and budget on AI. And on October 30th, the White House released an executive order on AI that directs action by private sector entities and governments on eight broad areas. And I'll just run through them very briefly. First is new standards for AI safety and security. Second is protecting Americans' privacy Third is advancing equity and civil rights. Fourth, standing up for consumers, patients, and students. Fifth is supporting workers. 
Six is promoting innovation and competition. Seventh is advancing American leadership abroad. And eighth and finally is ensuring responsible and effective government use of AI. And then on November 2nd, the Office of Management and Budget released implementation guidance following President Biden's executive order on AI. So now is the time for us to ask all of you, what are the implications from these uh, great leadership uh, steps that the White House and OMB have taken? And uh, what are you hearing as far as um, reactions from the tech world and other um, tech leaders? Uh, so let's start with Miriam Vogel as the chair of the AI Advisory Council. Um, what is your assessment of these important steps? Thanks, Lucy. And to be clear, any comments I make are on behalf of myself and, and Equal AI, not on behalf of NIAC, which will have its own public discourse coming up later this month. Uh, you know, I really just commend the administration for the most comprehensive effort possible. It's clear they tried to find every tool in their toolkit and within their power to answer the call for regulating and clarifying the expectation and the rules of the road. I think there's very few areas we've talked about yet and very few federal agencies that have not been invoked in this federal order. We're talking about um, looking at deep fakes it, coming up on an election when that's going to be particularly vital, but also uh, for the personal safety and um, livelihood and, and personal experiences of so many Americans, uh, it's, we need clarification on, on what is a deep fake and, and what the legal liability and expectations will be. And so they've seemed to go as far as they were able to in that respect. Uh, and privacy, civil rights and equity. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about how there are many laws on the books today and many of the, if not all the federal agencies have already come out in the past few years talking about how the laws within their purview are applicable to AI, uh, particularly the civil rights laws. We saw a call out to the Department of Justice to continue and, and even double down on what they're doing in enforcement to ensure that that algorithmic bias is addressed to make sure that uh, ways that um, AI is violating the law in any way should not be a protection because it's happening with the support of an AI system as opposed to a person. Uh, they looked also at innovation and competition. Uh, I was glad to see that they're giving thought to both how they can, uh, within their workforce, upskill their own employees so that uh, people can benefit from AI in a safe way. And so that as jobs evolve, uh, the, the federal workforce can answer that call and participate in that evolution. We've seen the international leadership as well, both in what was put in the executive order, as well as two days following uh, with the UK AI Summit and their, our, our significant participation there and another set of significant uh, announcements that came out of the AI Summit on safety in the UK. So uh, I, I think it's just really laudable uh, I, I understand it may be one of the largest EOs in history, if not the largest um, significant effort thought went into this, pushing you know to the edge of all of their capacity, including use of the Defense Pr Production Act. Uh, and I think that um, there's a lot that will need to happen. I'm glad that OMB uh, gave the operationalizing uh, document through its guidance. Uh, it'll be really instructive to see how all the different departments answer the calls within the uh, EO for the task forces that need to be set up within HHS Education Department and others um, where they have not had as significant prominent actions to date and, and certainly need to. And so that I think will be really important developments. Um, and then, you know, the rest is on, on Congress to see where which gaps they'll, they'll be able to fill uh, in following up on the efforts that they have underway. Well, this is definitely a big week. Um, so from the California perspective, Dan Ho, um, What's your assessment of the executive order and the OMB uh, guidance that were both released? Sure. Let me maybe say four points about it, recognizing that it is extremely hard to summarize 
a 111 page EO and a 26 page OMB memo uh, in this format. Um, but I guess I'll make four points building on, on what Miriam said. One is, this is a major achievement. Uh, this reflects a whole of government effort, comprehensively thinking around uh, across the entire uh, landscape. The second is, uh, by our count, there are 150 some requirements uh, in the executive order uh, that all are on relatively short timeframes. More than 90% of the kind of deadlines within this EO are under a year. So there is a lot that has to happen uh, to, to give content to this. In addition to what Miriam spelled out, let me uh, highlight kind of uh, three that I think are particularly notable. One is the leadership structure. Uh, that actually creates a White House AI Council, uh, creates the chief AI officers, which actually the NIAC um, had uh, recommended, and creates internal governance boards within agencies really to have top level uh, strategic planning and leadership around these issues. Uh, the second is related to what uh, Miriam had mentioned, which is R&D. And there are kind of really interesting moves here being made to to pilot immediately things like the National AI uh, Research Resource, but also a really significant portion of the EO is devoted to the question of foundation models that are at the core of generative AI and uh, understanding the sort of national security uh, implications under, under the Defense uh, Production Act. And then the third uh, is personnel. Uh, the administration has announced a quote unquote AI uh, talent hiring surge uh, and uh, that is really significant given the dearth of technical talent that currently exists within the government. The third point is that a lot of this is going to have to hinge on uh, implementation. In some earlier work, we showed that for the prior two executive orders, agencies actually struggled for precisely these reasons, uh, the fact that things were pretty fragmented and decentralized. Uh, and so, for instance, only about half of agencies that had demonstrable use cases of AI had actually filed AI use case inventories as required under uh, one of the, the prior uh, EOs. Uh, it will remain to be seen how significant this AI talent search is. Uh, things like the Presidential Innovation Fellowships, the US Digital Service are term limited. And what agencies really need is long-term technical talent within agencies to, to implement this. The last thing I'll say is just on the OMB memo, which I think is a really well-crafted uh, memo. Uh, and I really urge people to kind of uh, read it because it, it, is, it is quite well done is largely speaking to the AI uh, use within federal government when it comes to the deployment, acquisition, procurement, uh, and development of AI, uh, not outward facing regulation of AI in the, in the private sector. And I'll just note one that I thought was particularly notable, which is that OMB uh, has a kind of requirement for uh, close to real world testing of how an AI system actually works within the federal agency context. That's really significant in the sense that uh, a lot of AI benchmarking and testing right now is done in a kind of laboratory setting. And what that means is FDA might approve an algorithm that was only uh, developed and evaluated on a single hospital. And then we see really massive performance degradations the moment that algorithm is moved to a different context. That's a major challenge for the federal government if it procures an AI system that was developed in one context, moves into the federal agency context, and just we may not know currently how well it works. And that call for rigorous kind of close to real world performance testing is, re is a really critical move, I think, by the OMB memo. Well, thanks for highlighting these very important aspects. Um, Seth Waxman is a former very high level um, Justice Department leader. Um, what do you see in the executive order and OMB guidance uh, that's important for people to understand? Well, I, I want to echo the my my the previous speaker's commendation to the administration for producing a document and stimulating action that is really sort of historic in scale and unbelievably ambitious. I mean, I think, you know, to Dan's point about the sort of uneven implementation by agencies and departments of the prior EOs, I think this much more comprehensive executive order reflects the learning that, you know, was done in response. 
Um, it is true that there, there are a bewildering number of tasks that have this been assigned across the executive branch, including the, in, the so-called independent agencies and very, very ambitious deadlines. I think, you know, from having worked for years in the with the Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council, I can tell you that none of this is coming as a surprise to anybody in the executive branch. This document reflects a lot of work agency by agency in terms of evaluating what needs to be done and what can be done. And it's no surprise that OMB came out with this ex exceptionally detailed blueprint for how to go about doing this two days after the executive order was issued. A lot of this thing, a lot of this has been worked in advance. We can only hope that the government will not be shut down, uh, preventing any of this from occurring on the timetable that that's expected. I, I do think that in terms of where the the implementation burdens lie, one of the things that struck me is how much there is for the Department of Commerce to do. Um, in particular, NIST, the National Institute for Science and Technology, which is charged with the very important task of identifying, coming up with standards, best practices, and safeguards. And I, as an American, I very, very much hope that the government has the personnel resources to be able to do this. Um, you know, one thing that sort of leapt out at me a little bit is how little of this is directed at private, the private sector. You know, it is certainly short of legislation. There's a limited amount that the president himself can do with respect to private sector mandates. And, you know, Miriam pointed out at the outset that he has invoked the broad authority that he has under the National Defense Act of 1950 to require certain things of private industry in areas that may critically affect national security, like transparency. And, you know, perhaps later when we get to, you know, the area of uh, justice, you know, we can talk about the importance of enabling and developing open box generative AI, as well as what we now have, which is essentially black box, which requires people to just accept on faith that the, the AI program is going to get things better than humans could uh, and not be misleading. But I, I want to applaud the president and, and the hundreds and hundreds of people in the administration who worked on this. Michelle Lee, you have such deep technology expertise in addition to being a lawyer. Um, what do you think about the um, the private sector um, response to this uh, executive order? And, and what are other thoughts do you have about it? You know, having led a governmental agency to the point that Seth raised, uh, the amount of work that the agencies put into and the department's putting forth this executive order is extraordinary. And I like the, the president's leadership on this because it really provides the impetus for every relevant department and agency within the government to look deeply within its organization, to find the opportunities where they can use AI to enhance their mission and the delivery of their services to the American public, while also mitigating the risks that are posed to the government and to our society. So that nationwide impetus, I mean, it's so broad reaching, is the absolute right thing. Because when you're reading, leading a department or you're leading a governmental agency, you are going to look long, deep and hard to find those opportunities and to minimize those risks. And moreover, you have short deadlines. So it's really, I think, the right step for our country to um, the, the 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 action items launched here will will lead to good outcome, and it's thoughtful. From the technology side of things, the things that they ask the governmental agencies to focus on, things like encouraging the application of the NIST AI risk management framework. That's common sense. Um, also, encouraging red teaming, where for your systems, your AI systems, you're trying to break them. 
you're testing their vulnerabilities so that hopefully you find the vulnerabilities before those with malicious intent find the vulnerabilities. So in a number of ways, it's very thoughtful, it's comprehensive, and it will lead our country to a better place. The implications on the private sector, I think, are much less. Um, there's a lot of um, study, proposed guidelines, proposed best practices. Hopefully, the private sector will you know, take uh, an active role in the crafting of those best practices that they will then uh, follow on to, sign on to, and abide by. There is one other noteworthy point in the EU, and that does require developers to notify the US government uh, if national security is implicated when training AI systems and to share safety test results for new AI models when the computational size exceeds a certain threshold. And that's a surprising move uh, invoking, uh, as the others have referred to, the Defense Production Act, typically uh, reserved for times of national emergency. But I think this administration views AI as such a strategic opportunity and potential vulnerability that they they are treating it you know, in this manner when it pertains to national security with a very heightened level of scrutiny. So that was, I think, particularly noteworthy. Trooper Sanders, um, we want to know what you think of the executive order. I think the, the point about that this is focused on government and not the private sector is important. Um, and I also think that as a signaling device, you know, the, the, the government is an important customer and market. And uh, for those either in, in large legacy companies or those with the startup glimmer in their eyes, um, you know, to be able to tap the public sector, be it federal, or I also think it's significant that the executive order touches on AI and public benefits, um, which are uh, funded in many cases at the federal level, but administered at the state and county level. So I'll, I'd be curious to see how this will affect um, in sending market uh, signals. Finally, I do think that the, the uh, public comment window for the um, OMB uh, uh, memo that went out is, is a real important opportunity for communities and sectors who are um, concerned about being affected by AI um, and who have a public interest in, in um, how the government uses AI and more broadly, um, this is a real opportunity to make voices heard and do it in a very thoughtful and deep way and to put issues of concern to critical communities on the table um, um, through, through this process. And, and I'll just finally just say, this comment part is a really, um, is a place where you could use lawyers and those who know how to, to write and think in such rigorous ways. Um, so there's a great public interest opportunity for lawyers to help um, uh, affected parties make their voices heard. Well, thank you, Trooper. There's so many developments this month and so little time to talk about them, but we don't want to forget the um, October 30th um, announcement by the G7 country leaders that adopted the international guiding principles on AI and a voluntary code of conduct for AI developers so, Miriam, can you tell us very briefly um, what this uh, announcement by the G7 leaders amounts to and uh, what you see the implications for that? I think it's a really important development. I think, you know, while we're looking to the U.S. government to clarify uh, our legal practice and expectations, uh, particularly because it's the home to so many of the technology companies, we have to always remember that uh, AI does not operate within borders and, and we need to be mindful of uh, the the voluntary guidelines and, and non-voluntary guidelines that need to be put into place across the international community. And so, uh, again, as you say, a really significant development where we have guiding principles for those who are developing AI to make sure there's alignment on what does it mean to have responsible AI? How do we make sure that we trust AI systems and that they deserve our trust? And again, that's something that really needs to happen across international borders as is happening um, or happened in the UK this week with the safety summit, um, as is happening with the Hiroshima process that you're asking about now with the guiding principles. Um, 
and that are based on the OECD AI principles, which uh, really was a first significant st step forward where uh, all partner uh, countries uh, and organizations came together to decide on, on what are good AI principles. And that happened a um, few years ago. Uh, and that was the first of its kind opportunity where um, you know, people did the hard work of aligning on what is even a, a good AI principle. And we've seen that used in a bunch of different ways, uh, not only in the Hiroshima process, uh, but also in, in our own um, NIST. We referenced earlier the uh, NIST and the Herculean uh, tasks on their plate. Well, they've had some Herculean tasks to date. And, and one is the framework that they've released that I hope everybody here is familiar with and using in some way. Um, but the definition of AI, you know, as you recall, if anyone who's worked in AI for a few years, uh, we used to spend, you know, an entire discussion just talking about what is an AI system and OECD took a first step forward in explaining what that was. NIST took it uh, the next step forward in, in updating the definition based on the OECD definition. Getting back to that original question, I thought that thoughtful question on, on what do we need to make sure that our young lawyers, our law students, and as Seth points out, uh, our lawyers of all ages are mindful of, is that we need to reframe how we're thinking about so many of our lanes because we can't just operate in a singular lane. Uh, I think a lot of what we as lawyers need to do is understand that um, the AI practice is not for tech lawyers, it's for all of us. It will touch all of our industries. And likewise, when we're talking about law, we have to keep our eye abroad as well and, and be thinking about uh, what is happening with the Hiroshima process, with the, the code of conduct that was just released, uh, with the EU AI Act that's coming down the pipe, um, with, with you know, uh, so many of these important milestone discussions and decisions that, that are coming out of these international organizations uh, that should impact our best practices. And I know we'll talk more about the soft law use, but uh, I think that needs to be much more how we think about uh, how we advise clients going forward, because these questions will not all be answered as quickly as the AI is being built. And so understanding what the best practices are is a significant development. And I am grateful we now have this alignment on the code of conduct uh, from the G7 leaders that we can uh, use to advise our clients and ourselves on some of the best practices. Michelle Lee, um, Miriam mentioned the EU AI Act, and we don't want to um, forget that uh, this act is working its way through um, to become final. Um, what are the implications there from the EU taking a leadership role in this area? Yeah, no, the EU AI Act is noteworthy because it is, Lucy, one of the most developed proposals to regulate AI uh, looking to be released uh, uh, at the end of the year. Um, and really under the AI Act, what they do is they classify AI systems according to the risk they pose to users. Um, the AI application will face more regulatory scrutiny, the higher the risk it presents, and less regulation, the lower the risk. So they've identified five categories, uh, including one category, which is unacceptable risk. And these AI applications are outright banned, such as the use of social scoring. Um, the next level down is high risk applications, which have implications on safety and fundamental rights requiring approval, pre-market approval before entry into the market. And then lower risk applications requiring compliance with minimal transparency requirements, allowing the user to make informed decisions. Um, and the EU AI Act also added a provision on generative AI applications that they comply with the following transparency requirements, which is disclosure that the content was generated by AI, also designing the models to prevent it from generating illegal content. It'll be interesting to see how companies comply with that. And also publishing summaries of copyrighted data used for training. Again, interesting how to see how the companies will be complying with that or can. And what I will note is that um, the EU AI Act, unlike the White House executive order, is very concrete, has specific requirements, and has fines associated with non-compliance. Whereas the uh, White House executive order there's you know, studies, recommendations, best practices, and so forth. But I think in our instances in our country, the, the White House executive order 
broad, comprehensive, and I think it's about as best as we could do at this point in time, especially given the uh, gridlock that we're facing in Congress. So I, I again, uh, uh, commend the administration, and it's about as much as we can do at this time, but in contrast to what is being done um, or progressing through the EU in the EU AI Act, where they look to lead in this area, much like they did with GDPR. We certainly don't want to um, end this discussion without focusing on what guardrails are needed for AI. And we all know that tech industry executives have stated publicly that strong ethical principles and guardrails are needed for AI. Um, Daniel Ho, what do you think those guardrails should be? And do you think the executives who have asked for them have some in mind that we should be um, aware of? Well, Lucy, there is no shortage of ethical frameworks uh, for AI. I think uh, my colleague, Marie Chishaki, who was a 10-year member of the European Parliament at one point in time, quipped that there are 182 ethical frameworks, and that's just in the EU alone. And so I think uh, what we're seeing kind of related to our earlier discussion is really the beginning of the shift from a purely voluntary self-regulatory approach that relies exclusively on these kinds of ethical frameworks to something uh, where there are more teeth like in the kind of requirements that Michelle spells out in the EU AI Act, or the kinds of requirements that are going to be promulgated pursuant uh, to the EO. At core of, uh, of all of these is a kind of assessment of both the benefits and different dimensions of risk. And I think when it comes to uh, sort of the use of AI tools within the legal profession, uh, there are a number uh, of these risks that rise to the top, uh, so uh, I think uh, data quality, I think, is a, a really important one when a lot of these generative AI models are trained uh, really on all of the data that exists on the Internet. And, uh, you know, news alert, somebody on the Internet might be wrong. Uh, and uh, some of these models may regurgitate those wrong answers, uh, as SCOTUS blog found in over half of the instances of questions it asked about the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, similarly, there are real concerns about uh, bias and, and disparity uh, that can be propagated uh, through these models. One that I don't think uh, folks know enough about, as is illustrated by the uh, gentleman who became known through the New York Times headline as the ChatGPT lawyer, is the high rate of uh, what folks call hallucinations in generative AI output. Uh, in one study that we did, uh, the hallucination rate, the rate at which generative AI models can make up facts or cases, approaches something like 90% in different settings and goes uh, is much higher in less prominent jurisdictions. So for a subtlety here is that, uh, you know, good lawyering entails finding the right precedent in the jurisdiction of interest. And if the only things you're finding are uh, uh, things that are outside of your jurisdiction and this generative AI model doesn't identify the, the most appropriate, say, uh, Ninth Circuit precedent or, or the like, that's going to be a problem. And those are the kinds of things that you want to be aware of through these kinds of frameworks. And then I think, as Seth had mentioned, confidentiality. I think there are a lot of folks who probably don't recognize that depending on the terms of service, what you're pushing forward into a kind of web-based query uh, may be stored and trained on by a company um, and being clear-headed about what confidential information you should and should not uh, be able to put on uh, uh, into a prompt uh, on what kind of a platform is, I think, going to be really critical for uh, data pr protection, client confidentiality, and the like. We had one uh, research team that was able to extract, for instance, social security numbers by you know clever forms of prompt engineering, uh, and uh, that is obviously not the kind of thing you would want to have it happen to your client. The ABA House of Delegates actually took a, a leadership um, step by adopting Resolution 604 at the mid-year meeting in New Orleans. And that resolution um, has guardrails for developers and calling for human oversight and control, accountability, and transparency with AI. Um, does anyone want to add any other uh, ideas for guardrails that uh, should be considered? I will just add one. Um, I think in addition to that, it is human engagement and involvement in the development of AI use cases in developing how AI is being used and how it's being deployed 
um, and, and particularly when we're, we're talking about areas of concern to the public interest, or frankly, a lot of areas um, that lawyers, clients are, are working on are in sensitive areas where you really need to bring in the voice and expertise and perspective of people who are most affected and also by the experts who are working. So we talked about the blending, the, the uh, AI can supplement and augment human capabilities. Well, you need to make sure that you're bringing in the frontline workers and experts who are involved in that work to ensure um, a better use of, of AI. The accuracy, safety, and reliability of these AI legal applications, um, you know, are these AI systems going to need to be tested before being allowed to go online? Just as an attorney has to take a test before being admitted to a bar. And mm -hmm. if so, how and by whom? And also, what obligations should be placed on large language models for retraining and updates? I know as a practitioner in the state of California, I have to undergo periodic MCLE training. So what about the AI models that are um, giving you know, legal answers? And really, again, addressed very well in, I think, ABA's Resolution 604, how much does the legal practitioner have to provide in terms of review of the output of these AI systems and how much transparency and explainability? And I think an important point is, what if any disclosure should be provided to clients about the work generated by AI and when should that be provided? Do you have to disclose to your client uh, that you're going to be using these tools before the client retains you? Or is it at the time of the provision? I'm going to be using this system. Is that okay with you? And give them the choice. Or is it after the fact? Do you have to put that in a contract? Do you have to put that in writing? Is it verbal? Do you have to disclose it on your bill? So I think these are all very interesting questions in terms of guardrails and protections for the client and their awareness of what they're getting, what they're paying for, uh, that the legal profession will have to address. That gives us some important things to work on. Actually, an interesting proposal um, by the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez in June focused on um, the creation of an international AI watchdog body like the Atomic Energy Agency. Um, does anybody have an idea about whether uh, this type of international uh, body to review AI um, applications and capabilities makes any sense? I would say that that I think it's a, it's an interesting proposal just given the, the both the complexity of AI and its global nature. I think on the positive side, it can help potentially develop certain norms um, um, and and things that are outside of formal law and hard law that can help guide. I do think anytime an internet new international institution, the idea is being stood up, there's a lot of hard hard conversations that need to be had um, about um, uh, who dominates, who's at the table, how the priorities are set, and what matters. And I think we're really seeing that even this week in the the with the United Kingdom's um, summit uh, on AI, where there's there is a, a heavy focus on this. Uh, interest in the so-called existential risks of AI. Um, but there's a counter um, to that, that we have known a lot of more near and present dangers and concerns about AI for years um, that, that you know, are potentially being ignored and have been ignored historically. And so I think we really have to ensure that the agenda setting um, is as equitable um, as possible. This brings us to another very important priority, the ABA and um, people globally, which is how can AI improve access to justice? Trooper, what are your thoughts about that question? You know, and I'll, I'll de defer to my legal practitioner uh, um, colleagues here, but I think there, there's an extraordinary opportunity um, to really open up the pathways, um, both extending, uh, giving people who need um, good representation and, and and opportunities access, but also I'm very curious about how this can help scale the capabilities of lawyers and legal practitioners um, and others. Um, I do think there is one sort of flashing yellow when talking about AI and access to justice that I've seen come up in other contexts around public um, interest issues and in that we are maintaining a level and frankly raising the bar on quality and that we don't conflate introducing AI as providing cut rate 
uh, uh, non-grade A um, services and support, but use it to raise the bar, but scale it and make it more accessible. Well, thanks. Dan Hode, can you add to um, Trooper's observations about improving access to justice? I, I think President Carter at one point of time, I think in a speech, maybe to the ABA, said, uh, we as a country are overlawyered and underrepresented. And my colleague Deborah Rohde followed up on that uh, a number of you know, just a number of years ago and said this this situation has not changed. Uh, so there is a real potential here uh, with the rise of these kinds of systems to actually enable uh, improved representation for a wide range of individuals who are currently not able to find a lawyer, uh, who are uh, uh, who can't afford a, a lawyer if they're able to find them, and 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 the like. There are all sorts of tasks like document review, contract revision, drafting of standard form contracts uh, that are really difficult for a large number uh, of Americans and pose these really significant access to justice issues. The second point I want to make here, though, I think builds a little bit on, on some of what Trooper was saying, which is uh, this, this future is in many ways uncertain. Uh, one of the questions here is, will uh, these uh, technological tools develop in a way that concentrates power within a small number of companies, given the large amounts of data and compute that are required to train one of these models? Or will we see a more open uh, kind of approach that as a result levels uh, some of these uh, barriers uh, 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 to access to, to justice? That comes up, for instance, in the kinds of proposals for uh, having licensing models. Uh, and, and the idea here is that uh, some of these large models may pose risks. Therefore, the federal government should set up a scheme by which we issue a license to operate a large language model or a generative AI uh, uh, model. Um, and that would have really profound consequences on the number of uh, sort of firms that are able to develop these kinds of models and move us into a more closed ecosystem than we have conventionally, and also have really profound implications on some of the more open models that really enable a wider range of individuals to really try to uh, understand the uh, beneficial implications of this technology for a wider range of individuals. We have a question from Ruth Okedeji. She is a professor at Harvard Law School and director of the Berkman Klein Center. Ruth? We've all heard about the use of digital sweatshops and other labor disruptions that are occasioned by the adoption and deployment of artificial intelligence. We've also heard um, about the costs, the environmental costs of the design and development of AI technologies. How can we better design or shape AI to reflect our common values and our shared hopes? Dan Ho, what are your thoughts about how to shape AI in the best interests of society? I guess I would go back to something we started off with in this conversation, which is we really need to understand where uh, these uh, technologies can complement rather than substitute for human labor? And where can we invest in those so that uh, uh, labor uh, and, and workers can become more productive so that the gains don't simply go uh, kind of to, to capital? And then the second, maybe just briefly to comment on in terms of the, the energy uh, and environmental side, you know, uh, some folks have, have uh, uh, proposed kind of uh, regulations or like a tax on kind of energy intensive compute. Uh, it's not obvious to me that that's the right kind of instrument. You know, if you're worried about uh, sort of the energy expenditures, why should we have an exceptional tax for AI as opposed to simply a broad carbon tax uh, 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 across the board? And I think this also illustrates some of the tensions between calls for AI regulation, where those who are really worried about the geopolitical competitiveness of the country uh, would really worry about the tax that could slow down 
uh, or make more expensive uh, uh, forms of innovation. Ultimately, one proposal I'm quite favorably inclined towards is the National AI Research Resource, which was introduced uh, in a bipartisan way through the Create AI Act, which aims to provide computing and data resources to a broader set of individuals to democratize access uh, to AI. This question around um, um, labor and, and dignity and, and, and our, our sort of social standards raises around AI raises an important issue. Um, and that is that really there are many concerns about AI where actually AI is second chair. The first chair is the longstanding issue around dignity, quality of work, compensation, labor protections, et cetera. And I think one of the important things to, to, to keep in mind is in many ways, AI is going to... Um, allow us to scale our strengths and our faults as a society. So the risks around uh, if we had proper labor standards generally, that is a way of addressing the labor concerns around AI. If we, ha if we were tackling issues around bias and equity generally, it would blunt the effects of bias that AI introduces. And so I think for lawyers who may not consider themselves you know, uh, connected to AI, if you work on a broad range of subjects that touch the public interest, you are very much critical to the future of AI and its responsible use and deployment. I just I want to I want to amplify you know Trooper's comments and also go back to your more general question about how AI can improve access to justice because, and I suppose I can all tie it to Ruth's question about how can we better design or shape AI to reflect our common values and shared hopes. There's no question that AI can be used in some of the ways that were identified to improve access to justice. I mean, it can clearly provide for pro bono lawyers to take Trooper's point, uh, legal resources to those who otherwise help those who are otherwise unable to find an attorney at a very low cost. It greatly expands the possibility for individuals to better advocate for themselves in the legal system. I mean, you can see already, for example, generative AI making it easier for immigrants or visa applications to apply for status or for individuals to apply for public benefits. And clearly it offers the promise of identifying issues or patterns that have historically acted as blockers to justice. Um, and there, in the literature, there are some good overviews of the potential for AI to improve access to justice, as well as some of the risks. I'm thinking in particular of a, an article that was published recently in the Yale Law, the Journal of Law and Technology called Access to AI Justice, Avoiding an Inequitable Two-Tiered System of Legal Services. I want to focus on you know, at the real retail level uh, about litigation that I've been interested in for a long time, and that's fairness in the criminal justice system. AI systems are have been developed and are being used for things like DNA mixture interpretation, facial recognition, um, predictive policing, recidivism, recidivism risk assessments, and these are all being applied to a data set that is criminal justice data that is notoriously error prone. And courts and defendants are being confronted with the use of the, the results of these black box AI systems as saying, we have an AI program that suggests the following about the DNA or the following about um, uh, recidivism risk assessments. And it's terribly important that those tools be evaluated and analyzed and presented in a manner in which they can be evaluated and analyzed so that some of the results that we've seen that have shown that the application of these programs has greatly introduced, has greatly increased the error rate um, doesn't happen. There's a, there's a forthcoming article that uh, I think in the Cornell Law Review may be out already by Cynthia Rudin and Brandon Garrett about glass box, what they call glass box AI, which is which takes on directly 
from the perspective of uh, an electrical engineer specializing in this stuff and uh, a very prominent, thoughtful lawyer. The myth that these programs can't be analyzed, just as we've evolved with respect to, you know, criminal justice laboratories, the FBI crime lab and state crime lab, simply having to take as given what their results show. And we now have a system in which lawyers and experts have tools to evaluate the accuracy and reliability of those things. We absolutely have to do this in the criminal justice context and more generally for civil justice purposes. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that using predictive AI and generative AI is are making things more inequitable with respect to um, you know, home mortgage, risk evaluations, insurance, you know, risk evaluations, et cetera, of people who and groups of people who have historically been subjected to discrimination even before AI became an issue. I mean, I, I remember reading a couple of years ago uh, a report about the ethics of artificial intelligence that UNESCO of all bodies put out, um, you know, evaluating how mindful one has to be about the ethical use of artificial intelligence with respect to gender issues and race issues and economic issues. And I think when we're talking about improving access to justice, we have to think not just about the promise of AI to increase access to justice for people who haven't had the access that, you know, that well-heeled individuals and corporations have, but also the threats to the administration of justice, civil and criminal, that AI can exacerbate. If I could chime in and just connect this to a comment that Trooper had made earlier, uh, which is this tension that we're seeing in the calls for AI regulation. So many of the recent kind of uh, dialogues have focused on more conjectural notions of existential risk that have actually led folks to call for the closure of models. And I think that is in tension with what Seth so uh, uh, sort of brilliantly describes as the the what and what Truber described as the very manifest and existing risks of the use of these kinds of models and uh, criminal justice and, and parts of civil justice, where due process and you know administrative law, laws commitment to transparency really means we should have open models uh, that can be uh, interrogated. The one other thing that I'll say is that there is a really compelling way in which the shift towards forms of machine learning can inject a form of transparency into systems that simply was not there before. So our team did some work with the Treasury Department uh, exploring the use of machine learning and tax administration. And everyone at that point recognized that we needed to have safeguards in place. Our team spent over a year building that out because it's very difficult to build those safeguards in when IRS does not observe uh, on the 1040 race and ethnicity. And what we found really through the, the impetus for machine learning is that legacy non-AI systems exhibited really disturbing disparities in the audit rates between Black and non-Black taxpayers. So I think it's worth it to realize that while AI systems can exacerbate disparities, so they can also uh, inject a degree of transparency that we didn't have in the, the sort of uh, uh, what my colleague Carrie Coglianese calls the ultimate Black box, which is the human mind. Yeah, and I'd like to jump into is uh, on this very interesting discussion here. Now that you've got us all started um, on the issue, I mean, the legal profession in particular on the criminal justice system, we play a special role in protecting the human rights and the liberties of individuals. And therefore, consistent with the dialogue that we've had today, our uses of AI have to be consistent with our values. And I will share with you a very concrete example. Um, at Amazon Web Services, we had a facial recognition technology, and it was alleged that it was more accurate in identifying light skin faces versus dark skin faces. Um, and it had a whole myriad of very beneficial uses, helping to identify people when they log into their bank account, enter a building securely, but 
police departments were also using it to identify suspects in the lineup of their images in their database. And so you can imagine the conversations that were had within an organization about, should we allow this? Should we not allow this? Given the stage of AI, um, given the level of transparency uh, and so forth. And ultimately the company decided to issue a moratorium on use by law enforcement and continued to extend that moratorium. So that's a very concrete example of AI systems are out there. They're capable of doing certain things, but all of us in the community, in the business side, in the bar, uh, particularly lawyers in the legal profession who deal with these issues have a critical role to play. Where is the appropriate place to apply AI technology? Where should we not apply it? And this is some of the issues that the EU AI Act addresses, which is it really depends upon the level of risk posed by the AI system. And the greater the implications on life, liberty, and basic human rights, the closer the scrutiny and the greater the, I think, regulation and testing and possibly even prohibition. I wanted to conclude with a sort of a lightning round on the question of what are the most important or overarching AI issues and essential questions that the ABA task force and the ABA uh, more broadly can and should address. Um, so let's start with Miriam Vogel. I just really want to drill down on something important that Trooper said, which is that, uh, you know, we're not necessarily talking about new problems here. I think most of what you've heard us mentioning here are laws that are on the books. Uh, most of what you're hearing us talk about are issues um, that AI either elevates or exacerbates. Um, and so I think um, bringing in the broader population to have a role in our AI development, in our regulation of AI, understanding the, the end of the day, for whom could this technology fail? Uh, making sure we understand what is the use case for which this is safe? What are the use cases for which AI should not be deployed? Uh, and who has not been seen in this process. Uh, and then to flip it on, you know, some of the other ways that we've been talking about to make sure that we can use AI as a tool for good. We can think about where there has been bias and discrimination in, in the past and, and how AI can help us do better uh, of unlocking as, as Dan quoted others, the black box in our mind. Um, so I think this is an opportunity for us to see the reflection that AI paints of our society for its flaws and benefits and, and understand that we all have a role to play. We need to step a little bit outside of our lane and make sure that we normalize what we like to call good AI hygiene, uh, that we become uh, conversant in what AI is, and we are thinking very intentionally about uh, how we can use it to make all of us do better and, and participate in a broader ecosystem. Let's turn to Seth Waxman next. I have to say, I, I, I don't think I could say it as well as much less better than Miriam just did. I mean, I, I think we've gone over you know, what the ABA and other legal institutions can do to prepare members of our profession to be good purveyors, consumers, and watchdogs of AI as it evolves to, you know, as Michelle put it at the outset, play a revolutionary transformational role in the lives of all of us. Now let's turn to Michelle Lee. Yeah, no, not a lot to add. Beyond what my colleagues have said, I'll just make two points. One is that the ABA um, has a critical role to play in sharing information with those in the bar. So making sure that our practitioners are, as these tools, these AI systems come out, are not giving too much deference to them, understanding the limitations of these things. I mean, the generative AI large language models give probabilistic answers not deterministic answers. So if we can keep that all in mind, that provides context by and the level of deference that we give to the system. So that's number one. And then number two is, given that point, let's be really deliberate about where we require human oversight in the output of AI systems, how much, when, and um, I think we will 
help mitigate many of the harms that could result with a whole variety of advantages that could be realized for the profession and for our clients. Now we'll turn to Trooper Sanders. So I think the the ABA and its members can really bridge the worlds of code and prose. And, you know, by definition, the law is about a lot of prose. And there are a few lawyers who, by design and technology and intellectual property, might bring in the area of code. But really, almost every lawyer in every type of practice um, and, and discipline is relevant um, in the era of AI. And I think this this community has an important role of not only uh, informing and educating, but also energizing and empowering so that those who feel like they live on the complete opposite side of the moon of AI and technology um, know that they actually have a critical voice. There's value to their practice and they should make room for themselves at the table when we're dealing with AI. Great. And we'll conclude with Dan Ho. Well, it's really hard to follow up uh, on that and say something novel, but I guess I'll make three brief points. One is uh, the AB has the, the ABA really does have this critical role to play to make sure that the legal profession rises to this moment and thinks about how to adopt responsible uh, forms of AI. The second, I think, going back to the sort of training and education uh, point, I'm reminded of. Uh, what one student said when I guest lectured in a, a class at Yale, which was just understanding a little bit of this technology made me a heck of a lot less worried about being automated away and gave me a sense of like how to work effectively with technology and technologists. And I think that uh, would be a really beneficial collaboration to foster so that technologists don't solve problems that lawyers don't really face uh, and that the law doesn't get in the way of responsible uh, adoption of technology. And I guess the final point I would leave you with is that we have been talking about this largely as a kind of one-way transmission of how is technology going to affect the, the, the legal profession. Uh, I think it's also worth noting the critical role uh, of uh, the potential uh, legal reform. Jen Palka, in her brilliant book, Recoding America, has this chapter on the new guy uh, in unemployment uh, insurance adjudication. She goes up to him and asks him, like, why are you referred to as the new guy? And he says, well, I only have 16 years of experience. Um, and I have to ask the person who has 18 years of experience how to actually adjudicate this really complicated claim. And sometimes what technology actually teaches us is that some of the forms of legal process that we have uh, uh, may uh, actually not be a pose a technological problem, but actually mean that we want to figure out how to modernize and simplify uh, some of these uh, uh, kinds of processes. And uh, the generative AI does hold that promise because you can potentially take a very complex uh, sort of a set of regulations and try to figure out, are there ways in which we could actually think about simplifying uh, this uh, so that the law uh, doesn't get in the way. Well, this has been a terrific discussion. And so on behalf of the ABA and the AI Task Force, thank you so much for your participation in the Presidential Speaker Series. I will now turn the program back to Mary Smith. Thank you again to our wonderful panel of AI experts. And stay tuned for our next ABA Presidential Speaker Series with Academy Award-winning director Martin Scorsese and Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear, Principal Chief of the Osage Nation. American Bar Foundation President Jimmy Goodman and I will be talking with Mr. Scorsese about his new film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Mark your calendars for Wednesday, November 15th. Consider joining the ABA at ambar.org slash membership. Thanks again for joining us.